if we were to see Jesus at this very moment, this is how we would see him. We would not see him in a human body. We would not see him um, in the way that the disciples did before he was crucified. But we would see him in his glorified state. But he also would see us much differently. And his perspective of the church, what the church ought to be, and how he describes it, is something that we need to really learn from. We need to understand. So beginning in verse number uh, 4, uh, John writes, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, Grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come. Speaking of the fact that he has always been, he always will be, and he will continue. He's an eternal being. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne, referring to seven aspects of the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Triune God, it are always t uh, together in, in heaven. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's something we will always remember of him. And we should never forget of him. That he loved us, and he continues to love us, and he washed us from our sins. And what a blessing. Verse 6, it says, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Now, the word clouds relates to um, people. And this coming that he has, when he's talking about the second coming of Christ, coming with clouds with, with people are the saints. Leave your finger there and... He speaks of it. He describes um, the group that he's coming with in Revelation chapter 19, just to give a little background and a little preface here. In Revelation in chapter 19 and beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore and did corrupt the earth with her fornication. And so this is relating to uh, God putting down all his enemies. Go to verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage, marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now again, I've said this in other times at other times. Does that sound like a rapture to you? Is that what your perspective of is Jesus meeting you in the air to judge and make war? No. Okay? His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so that's the name of Jesus. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's talking about Jesus. And the armies which were in heaven... Where, what did we just read about? Who was in heaven? Um, it says, and um, let us be glad and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper. 
And uh, then in verse, uh, I think it was a little bit earlier than that, um, it speaks of some in heaven. Um, verse 10, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See, thou do it not. Uh, I am thy servant. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was faithful and true. So the armies, are the, those that are in heaven, are the saints. That's the church. Verse 14, And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now here's another thought in relation to the rapture and the second coming. When the rapture comes and Jesus meets us in the air, where are we? Before the rapture, where are we? We're on the earth and we are meeting him in the air. When the second coming occurs, we're on white horses. Does the Bible say any place in the rapture accounts in 1 Thessalonians 4 or in 1 Corinthians 15, does it say anything about you and I in a moment in the twinkling of an eye being changed and then riding on a horse? Nope. It's just another thought. And so... <clears throat> This is, this is the second coming of Christ, and verse 14 says, the armies. That means this is a war mission. The purpose of it is for God to judge his enemies. And um, it says we, we, we are following him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Uh, the fine linen that we are wearing was mentioned that that was the righteousness of the saints. And out of his mouth goes the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and treadeth the winepress of the fiercest and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Go from there to Psalm, the book of Psalms, chapter 2. book of Psalms, chapter 2. This is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus being given... His enemies, being able to suppress all those who have been against him. The psalmist writes, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision or confusion. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Now God interjects into the text, and this is a direct quote from the Father. He says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. God speaking of his son, the Father speaking of his son. I will declare the decree. This is God in again, again, interjecting directly. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, capital S-O-N, that's Jesus, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So that's a little bit of background about uh, what Jesus is prefacing. He's prefacing in this text in chapter 1, current events, past events which were what, what the vision here that he sees, and future events, which is everything. So the past is the vision John saw in this text, which we'll reference. Chapters 2 and 3 are the things which are the condition of the churches at that time. And then verse, chapters 4 to chapter 22 are all the things which are to come, the future events, which have not occurred and will not occur until God's time. And so Revelation chapter 1, John is on the Isle of Patmos in verse 9. 
And I like how he puts this because uh, John writes in an endearing way, God using him as he is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to make us feel like we're all in this together. And we really are. He says, I was on, John, I, John, who also am your brother, so we're brothers in Christ, and companion in tribulation, we're all going through tough times, all going through struggles, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, waiting for Jesus to come, being a, a witness, occupying till during, you know, during the kingdom until Jesus comes to take us, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, John's in exile. The reason why he's in Patmos is uh, church, church history teaches that John was boiled in oil. And they couldn't burn him. He, he didn't burn. And so they threw up their hands because there was nothing they could do to him physically. And the only way that they could silence him from their perspective is to send him out into the Mediterranean Sea on a little island called Patmos. But God still gets his word out. And so he's writing this. The Lord Jesus shows up on that island and comes directly to John and gives him Revelation chapter 1 all the way to Revelation chapter 22. An amazing event. And uh, of course John, I'm sure, counted it a great privilege. It's on a Sunday. Verse 10. He says, I was, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. You know, even he was a church of one. <laughs> Nobody else was there. It's by himself. Um, so, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what Patmos was like then. I don't know if it was... A, I'm, I'm assuming it was a desert island or something. Because he's alone. And he's in the Spirit. God's Spirit is upon him. And he, in, in the Spirit, sees a vision. It says, he first, he says, I heard a voice behind me, a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in the book. What I'm about to show you, I want you to write down. And send it unto the seven churches. I want all the churches to know this. I want all the churches to, to see, hear this. So write it down. All the seven, unto the seven churches which are, which are in Asia. Unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. It's interesting how John refers to him. In John, he refers to him as what? The Son of God. But now he's referring to him as the Son of Man. And it says he was clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. So by looking at him or suggesting he's the Son of Man here <clears throat> doesn't degrade his deity, but helps us to understand that this really is the Jesus that he knew as the Son of Man. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. And so Jesus is revealing himself to John, and he wants him to write this down because he wants the churches to have this perspective of who he is. Here's what he sees. He said, I saw seven golden candlesticks first. Secondly, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. 
and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. One commentator uh, used the illustration of Niagara Falls. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Niagara Falls. Um, if, if you wanted to hear, you want to hear the sound of many waters, I mean, that is just to stand there and listen to the power of that going over. Uh, that, uh, that waterfall is unbelievable. So here's the perspective of Jesus. First, he sees him with hair white like wool that relates to his eternity relates to the fact that he is deity. He is in, in, an eternal being. We never want to lose sight that even though Jesus was a man on this earth, that he always remained God and will always continue to be God throughout eternity. And the wonder of what he sees is that in the midst of the seven candlesticks, there's one like the Son of Man. What that means is Jesus is to be in every church. He's to be the focus, he's the focal point of everything. That's what, that's what Paul wrote in, in Ephesians. That in all, in Colossians, that in all things he might have the preeminence. In Ephesians, he is the head of the church. So he has first place. He is the focal point in everything. There's a lot of things that we do as, as a church at First Baptist Church of Rose Hill. But there's nothing more important that we can ever do than to keep him first in everything that we do. And it's very easy to get, get off track in a ministry. It's very easy to go sideways as a ministry. But if we keep Jesus as the focal point, we'll do it less. We'll be more on target. And I think what's happened in a lot of ministries is that the attention has been taken off the Lord Jesus. And that's a bad mistake. And it becomes on men. Uh, we've had several ministries uh, recently in our area um, I confirmed this week. One ministry, of course, we um, a man that was well known had several different locations folded, and it's, and some of the and those other churches are it's, they're no longer called the same name, and that ministry was a gospel preaching ministry. There's another very large church <clears throat> that just recently came out. It's the first evangelical or first if you will, gospel preaching. I don't know how much really, they, but people look to them as a ministry which preached the gospel that just came out and made it very clear and very plain that they are okay with the homosexual movement. I, I'm talking about a, a, a very major church here that a multiplicity of people were going to that that's their position now. You think that they've kept their eyes on Jesus? You think that Christ is the focal point of those ministries? No. That's why the first one fell. And I can tell you that's why the second one will ultimately fall. Or, God will, or, or, or will be judged by God. And so Jesus is saying, I want you to keep this perspective of me. I want you to understand that I walk in the midst of all the candlesticks. And we'll find out what those candlesticks are in a minute. Then he says, not only are his hair and his eyes, or his hair, his head and his hair like wool, but it says his eyes were as a flame of fire. What that means is he sees everything and he, he therefore, because he knows everything, he can judge righteously and he, he can have a true perspective and so he has all the evidence no, you can't hide anything from him uh, the Bible tells us of God that the night is the same as light to God doesn't matter day or night 
He sees everything. And he sees everything in the church. To show you that is true, if you read chapters 2 and 3, and we'll not take the time to do that tonight, he told the pastor, before the pastor could say anything, what each church was doing. I know thy works. That's how he introduces himself in the letters to the churches. I know thy works. That's because he sees our works. And so we need to keep a perspective that we are serving an eternal being. We are serving a, a God that is beyond our understanding and a God that lives, has always been, always will be, and that God, when he makes promises, because I live, ye shall live also, he can carry through on those promises. That he can, he can make us live eternally. Then it says, <clears throat> in conclusion, in the vision of Christ, his revelation of himself, the perspective he wants us to have of him. Verse 15 says, his feet were like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. His feet, like unto fine brass, also relate to judgment. And as he walks up and down in the churches, make no mistake, he has every right to stamp out the evil, to stamp out anything that he, he chooses to judge, and he will. Even, the, even to the point of actually removing the candlestick from its place, eliminating each church. I was listening to the great J. Vernon McGee, and by... He just, he's on the radio. I just happened to turn to 820 this morning. And every once in a while, I, I'll do that just to, just to kind of hear some things. And uh, I'm, I may not agree with his, you know, everything. that I mean, he's, he's very opinionated, and he, I mean, he, he answers all kinds of questions. And, and everybody has a perspective. But he, he brought out something very interesting this morning. If you were to go to any one of the locations of those seven churches today... They're only rubble, and most of them, there's nothing. There's not even any evidence of any church at all. So what God actually did is eventually removed all presence of any of those churches. There were churches back that there was one particular, Hier Hierapolis, that was in existence for a thousand years. And that's really about the only one that you'll find anywhere in that area. A lot of them were in the area of Turkey. And they're gone. So, <clears throat> obviously, when ministries are not able to continue, and when, when ministries fold, God has everything to do with that. And we need to not make ever a mistake to think that God is not in control of First Baptist Church of Rose Hill. He's in control of everything. And so we need to please Him. We need to consider Him and look, at, look to Him in the lives that we live <clears throat> and what our perspective is of ministry. Verse 13, he says, actually going down to verse uh, number 17. It says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. Again, I am the first and the last. I've always been, I always will be. I am he that liveth. I'm alive and was dead. I died on the cross for you, but I'm alive. I'm the same one who met you with the, uh, with, with the ten. And then I'm the same one that met you with the eleven and showed you my hands and my feet. 
Behold my hands and, the, and my feet, it is I. Touch me and handle me. He ate before them. And so John recognizes right away who he is. In verse 11, or verse 18 rather. He says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And then he explains his perception, his vision, how he looks at the church. When he looks at the seven churches, in verse 20 he says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. His first vision of those ministries was to the pastors. And when he wrote the, church, the, the messages in chapters 2 and 3 to all the churches, who did he address? The Bible says the angel of the church. As he, so he looked to those men as stars. Turn, if you will, to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 3. A great verse of Scripture. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. Here's what he writes. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Now, he's not looking at the pastors of churches as superstars. They're not like Hollywood stars. They're not like celebrities. That's not at all. And, but yet, to be honest with you, that's what a lot, of, a lot of ministries have become. It's all about them. It's all about the men. It's not about the men. Stars are to light the universe. He made the sun, he made the moon, and the Bible says, and he made the stars also. And the only purpose of the stars is to be light. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Stars glorify God. The heavens, what? Declare the glory of of God. And so Jesus' perspective of us is that men of God are to shine bright and are to bring glory to God with how they lead the ministries that they pastor. But then he doesn't stop. He continues. So his perspective is, is that his men, his, his pastors, his preachers, whatever you want to call them, that they are men that shine the light of Christ to a lost world. Then verse 20, he says, And the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So he looks to the men of God in his ministries to be light, and he looks to the churches to be light. Jesus is the light of the world. The Bible says that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Turn to Matthew 5 and we'll close. Matthew chapter 5. And let's read what he says in his great Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, Again, he addresses light. He talks about <clears throat> us being salt first. That our lives should have a savor about it. That our lives should draw people by our demeanor, by our spirit, by the people sensing. That, that we adorn the gospel in a manner that people are drawn to it. 
But then he writes this in Matthew chapter 5 and going to verse number, number 14. Ye are the light of the world. So when Jesus said, <clears throat> the seven candlesticks are the churches. Every church all across the United States in every location that they are is to be a light. If you will, they're like street lights. Every place that a beacon of light, I'm not talking about seven points of light like our great president, George Herbert Bush. That's not what I'm talking about. We're not social ministries. We're not, we're not some um, just social program. We are to be a city set on a hill. We are to be a location, a place where in our city, in our state, in our, our city and county and state, in our country, and yea, the world, that we are shining the light of Christ to a lost world. And that's really what Jesus' perspective is of us. We, again, we do a lot of things. There are a lot of ministries. There are a lot of functions that we do. But as a church, we need to never forget the main purpose that we were organized. Every church, local indigenous church, is, is organized for one reason and one reason only. And that is to be a candlestick. So that in a dark place, and Seattle's pretty dark by the way, that we can shine the light of Christ into the darkness. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from His lighthouse evermore. But to us, He gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. The churches are along the shore of the harbor. The lighthouse is Jesus. And so what we are doing as the lights, the candlesticks, is we're lining the shores of every city and town and hamlet we can get our churches into and we are pointing everyone to the lighthouse because if they can't see the lighthouse they'll never get safely to heaven. Jesus is the lighthouse. We have, a, we have a perspective we're to have of Jesus. He has his perspective of us. Let's ask him to keep our eyes on him and for him to guide us to continue to be light. Our Father, we